Hello, and welcome to today's webinar about how to call external APIs from your mainframe. My name is Martin Bacall, and I am joined by Zev Avidan, our Chief Product Officer, and Jorge Millet, a software architect, who will be giving a demo at the end. But first, for some, house, for some housekeeping, um, if you can ask questions at any time during this by hitting the questions button, and we'll, we'll be answering them at the end. Also, please enlarge your screen by clicking on the two diagonal arrows at the bottom right hand of the slide. Now I'm going to pass it over to Zev um, to start the discussion. Hey, everybody. Uh, so today we'll be talking about how to access external APIs from a mainframe. But let's give it some context before that. So a lot of organizations are moving to API for strategies and digital transformations. And for a, a great deal of those organizations, especially large enterprises, uh, they have legacy systems. So the question is naturally, how do I integrate uh, my, my strategy? And so in the past few webinars, we talked about ways in which you can expose or extend your um, mainframe functionalities, uh, data, processes, uh, core mission critical workloads, how you can uh, expose those as APIs to be consumed by the digital side. Uh, but the question remains, what happens to the other direction? What happens for, if my mainframe needs to consume APIs from the outside? If my mainframe is to be first class citizen in the digital strategy, I need to both emit and consume uh, digital services. So. Today we'll talk about that a little bit, and we'll talk about how you can do that in an automated way and a very simple way, uh, which leads to speed. Uh, the one thing that you don't want to have is you don't want to have this kind of coupling where the uh, mainframe people and integration people always have to be uh, aligned. Um, you don't want to have a steep uh, learning curve for your mainframe developers, so they have to know everything there is to know uh, about APIs. You want to keep it simple. You want to keep it native. You want their solutions to uh, correspond to what they're doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So basically, you want to have them doing their own thing uh, and uh, using APIs from the outside in a very native way. Uh, also, you don't want to add any more workloads to the mainframe than that. If you are, uh, if you are uh, using uh, consuming APIs, that means that uh, you are adding workloads by definition, meaning you're using something, you're adding functionality, you're doing something new on your mainframe. So that's a given. But you don't want to add any more overhead on top of that. So how do you do that? Uh, also for the uh, API management side of the house for the integration people, you don't want them to you know, have to learn anything about the mainframe. You don't ha want to constrain them in terms of how they're building their API contracts to fit what the mainframe uh, can actually consume. You want everything to be seamless and you want to work in a contract first uh, approach and you want them to basically uh, create the, the APIs and, and have everybody else use them. You want to have the same process for your mainframe as for everything else. And also you want to have the same process for any kind of mainframe, regardless of you know, type, version, or, or what have you. So these are the main challenges when we're talking about uh, how do we consume APIs from a, on, on a mainframe from the digital world. Uh, and to talk a little bit about how uh, specifically we can do that, um, I'll move it over to Marty. Um, th thank you very much. Zev. Um, so we're going to use API Caller, which is an open legacy product, to, to show how this actually works. But the basic idea here is, like most development teams, you have a design time and a run time. So I'm going to start off first by desc describing the design time, how you design it, how you develop the code, all different parts you do. And then, then afterwards, I'm going to talk about the run time and how it all works together, which is these are just general development paradigms for how you do things. So when we talk about design we actually talk about um, what, what do you have as an asset starting out. Well, what you have in this case is you have an API specification, typically a Swagger specification available to you. Um, and so the first thing you really have to be able to do is import that in to whatever you're working with. Do, do an import of that and, and clean it up. And then you have to and then the next thing we do is we actually add an API endpoint. This is something the mainframe itself can connect to. 
Um, so we try to try to talk about first doing the import and then adding an endpoint that it can connect to. And then the next thing we want to think about, and, and something something that 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 Zev made, which is a very key point, is you want the mainframe developers to not have to worry too much about what's what's um, about API specifications and all those things. They care about COBOL. They've written in COBOL. They work in it. They want mainframe assets. So we generate um, mainframe assets that then can be that then the mainframe developer can then incorporate into their applications themselves. These are copybooks and actual COBOL code that all that all work directly with it. So then then there's there is some work you have to do some integration yourself to make it all work into your application. But that's stuff that mainframe developers are very used to doing. So the whole idea here is you have the integration specialist who does the work of exporting the inf of importing the information into what they're doing from the specification of generating the endpoint and of generating the COBOL code. And then you have the mainframe developer actually using the code, integrating it in, into their system so they can make the calls out and do the work. So that's how we divide that up, the same way that Zev was discussing on the last slide about those key and important points. So that's the design time flow for what we're actually doing. Next, we're going to talk about the runtime flow. So at runtime, what, what, actually, what actually happens? At runtime, one of the things we talked about is, is we don't want to have a heavy load on, on the uh, mainframe system itself. We don't want to add any load at all. Um, so you have a COBOL copy book and the COBOL code, which then you actually can, can generate data, but it's all standard um, mainframe data in buffers. And then from there, we actually can take that mainframe data and actually turn it into JSON automatically. Um, this is all scalable outside of the, of the mainframe. You can deploy it anywhere you want in the cloud and actually make that all work. So you do the conversion, and then you can send that off to the RESTful API because it's used to consuming JSON. And then from there, it gets a return back to the to the proxy of standard JSON again, which then gets converted back into data the mainframe knows how to understand and can go back to, to the Kix application as mainframe date, data in a buffer, making it very easy for all the information to go and for the people working in the mainframe to actually do their work without having extra load in their system with copybook codes. So that's the whole idea here is to make it so it works there and, and then everything else is automated outside and it's very easy to scale this system because you could have you could add to, to the digital side and do, do some collaboration between different proxies if you need to or just get a more powerful processor working things like that. And generally, some other important things to think about is the system is secure. Um, we, we have security in mind when we're building this, and that's very important for everyone involved. And there's no configuration needed in this type of design and in this, in this type of runtime. There's no configuration needed on the legacy side. You don't have to go in and make a lot of changes to your ZOS system. Uh, we don't care what, what version you're using of, of your um, Kicks. In this case, we're talking about Kicks. We can also do this IMS. We can do this other systems as well. And you're not locked into a single vendor solution. You can deploy on any cloud that you really want to work with. So all, all in all, the whole idea here is that this makes it really easy to scale and the right people are working on the right things and all the conversion is done in such a way to, to release extra load on the mainframe team and on the mainframe itself. So in discussing some of those higher level benefits, um, there's a number of different things we talk about here. You're really bypassing complex middleware, ESBs and other types of systems that just sort of get in the way of what you're doing. We just have a simple translation layer. It can work, um, and you can pass it to a queue, like a Kafka queue, which we're going to discuss in, in a use, user example in a couple minutes. Or you can pass it directly through to, to an end API um, as a direct connection. It makes it really easy to work. We also automate the API initiation. Everything's taken care of. Everything is automated and generated. Only the main thing the mainframe has to do is integrate some COBOL code that he's used to working with. And that reduces the, the total cost of ownership because you don't have extra middleware, you don't have extra things to worry about, and everything else. And I already mentioned the standard mainframe artifacts and the direct connection. But those are all the types of benefits we talk about, about API caller and about any type of solution like this that actually does this type of work. So that, that's uh, um, act, actually where, where we're going to go now. I'm going to hand it over to Zeb to talk about um, a customer case study on this.
Thanks, Marty. So this is actually an, an, an example from a customer who did exactly that. So uh, this is a large, uh, very large U.S. bank uh, that uh, was going through a digital transformation. And one of their key challenges were how do they integrate the mainframe into their processes and into their kind of digital journey. And what was unique about them specifically is that they chose the path of event-driven architecture. So everything is based on Kafka as a streaming uh, um, mechanism or a streaming hub, and everything, every node in the network uh, emits and consumes events. Uh, and they wanted the mainframe to be a first-class citizen in that architecture because for them, it's not just about leveraging the past investments on the mainframe, but also they're very much a live shop, a live mainframe shop. So they continue to develop additional functionalities, and they wanted the mainframe to consume APIs just to participate in that kind of uh, digital architecture. So they used uh, both ways, the ones that we've discussed in previous webinars, but uh, also importantly, uh, the API caller, in order to basically have the mainframe um, consume Kafka events um, on their uh, on their uh, main side with their Cobol develop developers, they created and exactly as Marty explained, they created a design time doors artifact for their Cobol developers uh, to work. Uh, their Cobol developers didn't need to know anything about you know how the API looks, uh, what are the specific nuances of their uh, API management product um, in terms of. On their deployment, it was the mainframe talking with Kafka on an Amazon uh, cloud uh, instance. Uh, but of course, um, uh, it's a hybrid solution, so it can run multiple places. Uh, and basically, it created kind of a smooth experience for both their mainframe developers and their digital developers, where none of them were coupled to each other. They can all do their own uh, thing. The benefit for them is not only their ability to move to the exactly the architecture that they wanted without any compromises, but also they were able to do that very, very fast. So within a few months, they were able to set up everything, including all of the concerns, and already start churning uh, 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 things um, uh, and, and, and moving them, um, moving the new services, both consuming and uh, emitting services and, and workloads from uh, uh, the mainframe. And ultimately, that's the goal. You want to move fast, you want to be decoupled, uh, and you want to be able to deploy rapidly uh, and consistently. Uh, so that's that's that example. Um, and because seeing is always uh, better than hearing, um, I want to move it to George to uh, okay, the demo so uh, we can all see exactly uh, what we mean by that. So George. Thank you very much, uh, Seth. Please confirm if you can see my screen right now. Uh, yeah, I can see this. Perfect, thank you. Well, um, I'm going to focus in, in explaining to you how the uh, design time works, because this is where the magic happens. Um, uh, first, uh, we initially need to have, you know, a third-party service provider that has a Swagger spec on the uh, API that we want to call from the mainframe. Then uh, we're going to uh, bring this Swagger specification inside of the uh, API caller, and we're going to be able to do things like public export or, or generate or edit and manage that Swagger spec that we're going to get as an input. And then we're going to be able to generate uh, basically three objects for each one of the services that we're going to uh, receive from the API, which is the COBOL code, the copybook in, and the copybook out. This code is going to be able to be uh, uh, put inside of the kicks area of the mainframe and executed every time you want to call the, the, the proxy. So that's the way this works. This is the logic, and I'm going to show you uh, all this uh, all this in live. Okay. First, let me show you the information that we put together uh, in order to explain to the customers what is the process of standing up uh, the full environment, how it works, how it interacts with um, the Docker's or the PCS environment that we can use because we have flavors inside. Uh, as you can see, it's very fast and easy. Uh, there are diagrams, there's everything explaining you how to do this. In order for the customers to be able to stand up the full environment and make it re working ready in less than a half an hour, okay. Once you have your environment running for the for the runtime, what you will see is basically uh, the the API color like this, okay. And before I show you this running, let me also you need to obviously have an input. This is public information about you know the the on the Swagger page uh, public information with the and a full specification of an API, the, the pet store, very famous example. 
you can see that I have here all the all the endpoints already published, and uh, so this is what I'm going to use basically as, a, as an input for my for my API caller. Uh, the only thing I need to do here is uh, sign in, put a password, and uh, there's no endpoints right now. Uh, what I need to do is to import the endpoints going to my uh, JSON file that I already downloaded to make this uh, faster in the interest of time. And you will see that as soon as I uh, click in, into the uh, editor, I immediately can see what's inside of the uh, of the file. This is on the left side. All, uh, the, the, the same look and feel that you have on the, on the Swagger page is the one that we are actually showing to you. With the difference is that, that, that you can do uh, editing here and changes and improves, and those improves or changes are going to be reflected locally into your environment. Okay? Uh, you can uh, actually choose and pick and whatever uh, that you can see the inputs and the outputs and, and everything that is uh, re related to each one of the services. So as I click done, what this is going to do is identify all the endpoints. And it's going to put an identifier to each one of the endpoints. So you will see that I have uh, all that I want in here ready to start making the conversion. To make the conversion, I can randomly just select any of them or the one that I want to convert, and I just click uh, Generate Clients, and this is going to create a zip file that you see on the bottom left of my screen. I'm going to open that zip file, and you will see that I have three components. The first component is uh, the, well, let me first show you the copybooks. This is the uh, request copybook or the copybook in, okay? And then you can see also the response copybook, which has the detail on the information that is going back to the API. But I want to go deep a little bit into the code because um, it is important for you to see what is that we are generating. So we have obviously the, the, the data division, which is where we define the inputs and outputs. We also have a, a definition of the URI map that we're going to be using because we need a URI map dedicated to in order to do the communication. Mario already mentioned about the way we com we have the communication. It's all secure. We're using the same channels that the customers use. Uh, we can run over RACKF or any standard security that the customer has already. Um, so this is a, a procedure revision where basically the customer needs to build the logic to extract the data and put it together for the calling of the of the API. Okay. Then there's the um, uh, section where you open the HTTP connection, then defining the proxy header, and then uh, making the um, request and receive the response. This is the section where actually the, the mainframe calls the uh, uh, the proxy and where the proxy actually responds and this response is basically received and, and uh, can be handled or managed in this, in this particular area of the code. It's important to mention that these two sections can be actually uh, controlled in a, a central routine and this routine could take, you know, convert as a standard way to do the extraction and also the, the reception back of the of the response from the from the API. So that's that's for all for the for the runtime. Sorry for for the uh, design time. And well, we already explained the, the the runtime, and this is the code that you're gonna put to, or use to do the call to the uh, to the proxy. Okay. So with that, I'm going back to you, uh, Seth and Mari. Thank you very much for that demo. Um, and I'd like, and I guess the that was all live, so I actually got to see how how to actually generate the stuff on the fly as you're going, which is a very key part to think about. And now we're going to move on to some questions. First question: I like the concept to see the value. My question is: Are there any limitations on the complexity or usage frequency of the external API? Um, Zev, I guess I'll hand that over to you. Sure. So. Um, I would say, I mean, the, theoretically, there's always limitations. I would say that mostly the limitation would be around, uh, you know, uh, the, the workloads that you're willing to put on the mainframe uh, and how much uh, you want to use it. I mean, if, if it's, you know, thousands and thousands and maybe more than that of requests per second, that will have, you know, overhead. That, by definition, that's made from doing things. But there's no limitations in terms of, you know, the types of uh, uh, APIs or complexity of the APIs or anything of that sort. Um, 
this is of course, as anything else is uh, this is customizable so if there are specific concerns that they can always be addressed so there's no um, actual uh, limitations in terms of complexity um, and there are there are many more flavors and different as you know as you mentioned this is a restful uh, API for example but uh, in other cases it might be a Kafka type API it might be you know other types of streaming APIs so there's a lot of uh, uh, flexibility there thank thank you very much um, and another question is how long do these projects take do we need pers do we need personnel with mainframe skills to use open legacy so I guess I'll, I'll start if you, you can answer that that's fine go for it I mean for the mainframe side yes you do need it because the old uh, point here is to enable the mainframe people to develop new functionalities using the eyes from the outside so for that part you know you, you do need the mainframe skill um, for creating the artifacts for them, you don't need many skills, uh, but it's very easy to do, as, 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 as you probably saw. So you can have the integration people just creating the artifacts and sending them to the mainframe people, telling them this is what you need to implement, and so you can work in a decoupled way uh, very easily. But for creating the new functionality on the mainframe, yeah, absolutely. you need somebody with, with mainframe skills, absolutely. Thank you. And how is security managed in transient and at rest? So in terms of security, basically what it uses is a standard uh, HTTP mechanism by uh, uh, for ticks, for example. And so the security is handled very natively. Um, all of the facilities, encryption, certificates, all those things that are supported in your URI map, which is the standard kind of uh, mainframe construct for, for communication, uh, will be supported. So uh, that covers, I would say, basically everything you would ever want to do um, on the mainframe side. Uh, and of course, the proxy side supports uh, those certificates and, and encryptions. And wh where does the API caller proxy run? So it's a, it's a Dockerized. Uh, um, but, you know, it's, uh, or PCF or Docker. Uh, these are containerized uh, artifacts. They are distributed, so they can run on-prem, on the cloud, uh, private cloud, public cloud, uh, basically wherever you want them to run. And will this support PL1 or just COBOL, COBOL only? Can we use a custom header? Will it support HTTPS? So, uh, it, of course, supports HTTPS, uh, definitely, uh, in terms of PL1 or COBOL. I mean, the API caller is a, um, is a method of doing things. It's a way of doing things. The actual artifact it generates can vary. So COBOL is what you've seen. It can also support PL1. It can support other things. Uh, there's, you know, a level of customization that can be done there. Um, but the, the same exact concept would apply uh, for, uh, for a PLI artifact. Uh, also, it's, it's applicable for artifacts that, you know, of course, it's not in the scope of this webinar, but it's applicable for, for uh, assets that are not mainframe-based. Uh, so, um, you know, S400 uh, uh, and other type of, uh, of uh, legacy systems. Great. We, we actually had a second question asking about COBOL, so I think that one you already covered. Um, how can a mainframe credential be, pa be passed to API during callout? to check for API access? So the way the mainframe credentials are, are being done is, again, using the standard uh, mainframe HTTP interface. So for example, you can bind a specific user ID to a certificate and use it this way. Uh, there are a number of ways and there are, there are best practices. Uh, but I would say that in order to understand how you to secure that, you don't necessarily need to read an open legacy book. You can just read, you know, an IBM Red Book, uh, because this is all very, very standard uh, in terms of the way that it's uh, uh, it's communicating. But basically, uh, the most common way would be to bind uh, uh, a rack of ID to a certificate. 
Okay, and someone wanted to, to correct us, and you can make a comment on this, but the web converse code used needs some setup in Kix, so, so no configuration needed is not correct. Not every Kix region has web converse configured to use it. Just a comment, but yes, this is very good. The person actually said that, 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 that this is a good solution. He just was making a comment. I don't know if you have a comment on, on web converse or anything like that. So yeah, so um, in terms of the, um, of course you need that type of, uh, but the way it's configured is basically instead of uh, um, putting all the details in the web converse, we, we use a URI map, which is kind of a, uh, allows you to do a pre-configuration for those things. So yeah, you, need, you do need the URI map definition uh, there, uh, but all the details go into that definition rather than in the code. So the answer is yes, you do need, you do need that type of, of configuration, but it's pretty easy and simple to do. Okay, and, and one more, what are the differences and similarities to, expose, to, to, to the exposing API solution? So, I mean, these are two different directions, the mainframe as a server and the mainframe as a consumer. Uh, the main difference would be the proxy object. Um, in terms of uh, if you consume services from the mainframe, you don't need the proxy object because basically you have the microservice itself uh, um, have, you know, this translation layer inside of the microservice. So uh, that's when the mainframe uh, em emits or, or expose services. The other way around, you do need that proxy object because you can't make the changes on the API side and you need somewhere to translate. And this is why you need the, the proxy object. But the proxy object, of course, is a very light type of object, only can, you know, takes the uh, raw data from the mainframe, you know, formats it in a way that uh, can be used in an API, calls the API and gets the response back. But you do need that proxy uh, object in order to do it this way wrong. I guess one more comment on that same thing, um, which that kind of brings up is in both cases that the goal here is to not add extra load to the mainframe itself, not make the translation ha happen happen there, which is why we, we designed it either to generate in the microservice or inside the proxy, depending upon which solution you use. That's where the data translation and some of the, any type of orchestration you would need, particularly in, in the other solution would work. The other thing is, that in exposing APIs, we also have the ability to do API first, which is more similar to this solution where an API already exists because then um, you actually have the ability to, to basically apply the Swagger page and actually ha use an existing API and map your outputs to it. So, so that that's, makes similarity in that sense. So um, and I guess that, that's all the questions we had today. Um, I guess in, in the end, I would love to I'd like to thank you, everyone, for joining, and I would like them to be able to um, to go to www.openlegacy.com slash mainframe um, for more details on how we've solved mainframe problems in general, both in exposing um, APIs and in um, calling them from, from the mainframe itself. So we, we hope you enjoyed this session, this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in, on some of our other web, webinars in the future. Thank you very much.